So a few days ago, I gave a presentation to a group of my students in the Grizzly Elite Training Academy, helping them with their mathematics. And I will be releasing part of that presentation over the next few weeks. But I wanted to go over something that was the most valuable of everything I talked about in the presentation, which I think you're going to find a lot of value, especially when it comes to breaking mathematics. All right, if you don't know who I am, my name is Joaquin Ravello. I got a perfect 45 in the IB diploma a few years ago, and I help other students also get perfect scores with the IB. Now, you need to know that the International Baccalaureate math, especially the math, in my opinion, is one of the most breakable subjects to exist, right? I don't think there's another subject area in the entire IB that is more breakable than mathematics. And the reason why I can say this so with so much certainty is because when I started the IB diploma, I had very good productivity skills, but I just didn't really know what to do. All right. And I did all the wrong things when it came to studying, when it came to allocating my priorities, which resulted in me doing very poorly at the beginning of the diploma. In fact, many of you might know that I actually got a four on my second exam, on my exam on proofs. I got a four out of seven. And after that, I vowed that I would do something different. I figured out this system, which I'm going to showcase in this video right here. And you'll be able to also supercharge your success. And essentially what happened here is I got a four in my math proof. And then after that, I got a seven on my uh, cosine, the trigonometry exam. And then I got a seven on my final exam. And then I got a seven, a perfect score. Actually, I got a perfect score, seven on my derivatives exam. I got a seven on my integral exam. And then I got a seven on my mocks. Long story short, I got perfect sevens thereafter. And it was by use, utilizing this strategy in this video right here. And I just want to start off and I'm going to be transitioning here between my slideshow as well as my presentation. All right. I've never seen anyone anywhere else on the internet present the content in this manner. All right. With just mathematics in general. Hopefully, like if you're watching this, you're probably taking the IB, but this can literally apply, be applied to almost any subject area that you study. I've never seen it being taught in this way. I've never seen it being taught from this perspective on what you have to, to do to improve, all right? And stick until the end because at the end, I'm gonna be going through some actionable examples of how to apply this into your own life when it comes to study, all right? And I'm gonna be going through some live examples of me doing questions of mathematics, how I approach it, how I approach the studying, how I approach the active recall, which literally just got me. Like This strategy is the most powerful specifically for math, but it can be applied to any other subject area that I like the most powerful strategy I've ever found that got me perfect sevens. All right. And it comes with the following, All right? It's the following idea right here. I want you to start by understanding what this is. Okay. And it's called the theory of constraints. All right. And this is the mindset shift I want to present to you. All right. The theory of constraints essentially states that of any system that hasn't succeeded yet, the reason why it hasn't succeeded is because there is some limiting factor that is stopping you from achieving your success. All right. As Bjorn says right here, the reason you are not where you want to be is because so there's some type of limiting factor, some type of bottleneck that is stopping you from achieving your utmost potential. All right. And this can be applied to mathematics. This can be applied to literally any goal, any project, any discipline, anything point blank period that you're working on. There's always some limiting factor. There's some reason why you're not able to achieve that ideal version of yourself, right? Maybe it's distractions. Maybe it's some type, maybe you're not doing the right thing. Maybe it's some type of personal issue. There's always some limiting factor that is stopping you. So it's up to you to identify what that is. Now, let me propose this question right here. What if you were to picture the ideal version of yourself? All right, I want you to do this right now. I want you to think about, or if you have a pen and paper, pause the video and write down what does your ideal version of yourself look like, right? What, what does the best version of yourself look like? If you were to become the best version of yourself, living your best life, how would you act? How would you walk? How would you talk? What would you think about? What would you be doing? What would you be achieving? How would you be achieving? What skill sets would you have? What belief systems would you have? Once you have done that, once you can very clearly articulate what the best version of yourself looks like, I ask you this question right here. Why can you not be that person right now? What is stopping you from becoming that best version of yourself? Why are you not able to live that ideal lifestyle? Why are you not able to act or not even act, but just become that type of person? In other words, what is stopping you? What are some roadblocks in the way? What is limiting your growth? What is limiting your potential? In other words, why are you not 
Why have you not achieved your goals? Why have you not become successful? Why have you not become this person that you want to be, this ideal lifestyle? Why what, Why have you not done that? What What is in the way? What is stopping you, All right? So what I want you to do, and this can be applied to your life, this can be applied moving forward, is I want you to do everything you can to identify what are known as the bottlenecks towards success. So let's get this general idea of theory of constraints, All right? In other words, the constraining system is stopping you from achieving the goal, the objective, whatever you want to achieve. I want you to identify what that is in your own life. All right. And now let's apply this specifically towards mathematics. Okay. So essentially in mathematics, I call the limiting step, the aha moment. So in every single question that you can't do, every single math question you cannot solve, there is one or many, maybe multiple, but there is one, typically one large aha moment, one large limiting step that is stopping you from getting that perfect score that is stopping you from achieving that end result. So my question is the following. When you do math questions, what is stopping you from finding the right answer? What is preventing you from moving forward? Now, let me ask this a different way. What is not stopping you? All right, if you were to list out the things that you did to solve a math question, what would that be? What are the steps along the way that are not stopping you? For example, arithmetic for most people, they have a pretty good arithmetic. They can add numbers pretty well. All right. If you can't do that, I strongly suggest you go back and master the skill. But for most people, this is not the rate limiting step. All right. This actually kind of reminds me of the chemistry rate of reactions. Like if, if you, if you know what that is, it's actually, this reminds me a little bit of chemistry where the rate limiting step and rate of reaction, but I digress. Essentially what you want to do is you want to, first of all, identify what is not stopping you. All right. So if I was to show you a math question, for I would assume that for most people, the arithmetic would not be the reason why you wouldn't be able to solve it. The fact that you can't add two numbers is probably not the reason why you didn't get that induction question, or it's probably not the reason why you didn't solve that series and sequences or that polynomial or that derivative. Once you identify what this is, you want to spend as little time as possible doing anything that isn't the rate limiting step. So once you identify what is not, you want to spend as little time doing that. And instead you want to spend all your time looking for that aha moment all your time identifying what is stopping me from achieving a perfect, like getting a perfect score in this question. What is stopping me? Why, why am I not able to do that? Now you need to understand that not all tasks are made equal. And if I was to graph out every single task could, you could be doing with task on the X axis and results on the Y axis, you find that you get a type of Pareto distribution. All right. This is just a law of nature. It's a law of the universe that tasks and just any system arranges itself in a Pareto way. Essentially, what you want to do is to find and schedule your studying around identifying what the aha moment is. What is that rate limiting step? This right here is the highest value task when it comes to active studying that you can possibly do. Figure out what is stopping you from getting the perfect question and then double down on that and eliminate that barrier. All right. So let me give you an example. Okay. You want to identify what that rate limiting step is. You also want to find what are known as aha moments which are kind of like, because for most people, the rate limiting step is the following, all right? For most people who are in math HL who want to get into, who are, I mean, most of the people in this channel are, I, I would assume, extraordinarily ambitious. You want to get into top university, you want to get hopefully a perfect score in the IB diploma. Though for most people, the rate limiting step is going to be the click, the aha moment, the, ah, I, I understood the different way to solve this problem. Right. Have you ever been doing a difficult math question and then all of a sudden you just get it right? It just clicks and you see how to do it. Maybe you see the question differently or you see a different way to solve that question. That's the aha moment. So you want to find what that is because that I would assume if you're a high ambitions and achieving high achieving student, that is probably the rate limiting step. The fact that you are stuck on trying to find that aha moment, that part that just clicks. So let me give you an example right here. All right. This is a very simple example. I give you the following. All right. I give you that a plus B is equal to five. I also gave you that a times B is equal to three. Now with these two pieces of information, I want you to find the following. All right. I want you to find a squared plus B squared. What is that? What is that equal to? All right. A squared plus B squared. What is that equal to? So I'm going to give you, if you're watching this online, pause right now, figure this out and then unpause when you're done. All right, so hopefully you took a crack at this question. Let's open up the whiteboard 
right here and look at it. First of all, I want to start off by, yeah, you can see it here on the left. First of all, I want to start off simply by writing the question so we can transition to the whiteboard. So I'm going to start like this. And then what I want to find is a squared plus b squared is equal to this. Now, what, yeah. There we go. Now, essentially, the thing that stops most people from solving this question, the aha moment, is figuring out, figuring out a way to rearrange this equation in terms of this right here. Because we want to utilize 5 and we want to utilize 3 to somehow figure this out. So most people don't realize, first of all, most people don't even realize that's the rate limiting step. Okay, most people look at this and at least this is what I would do. All right, I'm not talking about most people. This is at least what I would do, all right? Or at least what I did when I first saw this question a while back. I believe I saw this in grade 10. So this is what I would do. I would try to simplify it like this. B is equal to 5A. And then what I would do is I would plug B into this expression right here. So I'd do A times 5 minus A. Oops, I would do A times 5 minus A is equal to 3. And then I would try to solve this quadratic somehow. So this would be A times 5 minus A squared is equal to 3, which is A squared minus 3 minus, let's rearrange this a little bit better, A squared minus 5A minus 3 is equal to 0. All right, and then I have this quadratic, and now I, had, I need to do extra work in order to solve the problem. This works, all right? I'm not saying this is not right, okay? This, this works. It's not a good solution though, and hopefully you see why. If I try to simplify this quadratic even further right here, this is just, just this is nasty, all right? It is, this is not good. So the aha moment here, and this is what really gets students to that next level or that level seven, okay? How, how to get that level seven in mathematics is you need to find the aha moment to solve this as easily and as quickly as possible. So. Let's look at this question again. Why are you not able to do this? Okay, what is stopping you from solving this question? Well, it turns out that the reason why most students aren't able to solve this question is because they don't understand this expression right here. They don't understand that there's actually a trick involved. There's actually an aha moment, a got you, a ah, I realize it or I don't type of, type of thing going on with this question. Let me propose to you the following. All right, let's say I have a plus b squared like this. Now let's using simple binomial theorem, let's expand this expression. I get a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Now, hopefully you see where I'm going with this. All right, I'm going to get my marker right here. So this is a squared and this is b squared. Notice how I have a squared and b squared here on the right hand side. Well, it turns out that I can rearrange this expression to arrive at the following. All right, check this out. I can rearrange this, putting a squared and b squared on the left. Let, I mean, let's just keep it on the right-hand side. All right, I can move this, this 2ab over to the left-hand side. So I subtract here 2ab, and I subtract here 2ab. All right, so I move the 2ab on the left-hand side, and let's delete this so it doesn't get in the way. All right, so I subtract 2ab on the left-hand side, I get 2, and then I get a squared plus b squared like this. Hopefully you see where I'm going with this right now, okay? So I can essentially move this on the left-hand side, and look at that. Okay, we can solve this now. Why? Because we know this right here. We know this expression, a plus b, because we have it literally right here. And we also know this expression right here. We know 2a, or excuse me, we know, we know ab. We know a times b. Why? Because we have it literally right here. So notice how, oops, notice how, I can use that here and notice how I can use this right here. So if I make that substitution, plugging it in, I simply get the following, All right? That this is 
5 squared minus 2 times 3. Right here. All right, and 5 squared, as you know, is 25 minus 2 times 3 is 6, which is equal to 19. So the point I'm trying to make with all of this is there is one thing that is stopping you from getting the perfect score in mathematics. You need to identify what that is. Now, if you're pretty confident with the content so far, all right, and again, most students who don't get, like most students who, if you're in like the four or five range, it's probably because you don't understand the concepts itself. So that might be the rate limiting step. However, if you're in between a six and a seven and you want to get up to that seven, this is how you do it. You find those aha moments because those aha moments are typically the rate limiting step. Okay, it's typically the reason why you're not able to solve these questions fast and correctly. So in this case, the rate limiting step simply comes from the aha moment of understanding that you need to utilize this equation. And this is the thing about mathematics. There's a degree of intuition that comes in play with this. In order for you to know to use this equation, you should have seen it before you go into the exam. You should have had experience working with this in the past. All right, this is why I strongly suggest you do as many past paper questions as possible because that builds your intuition. And it's actually shown that the intuitive part of your brain, the subconscious mind makes up roughly like 90% of your processing power. So that's 90% of your brain power that most people just ignore. However, not you, not anymore. Do as many questions as you possibly can and you can start to see these aha moments in literally anything. That, that is typically the rate limiting step for most students. They're not able to identify these aha moments and then utilize them in past paper questions. And here's the best part about this. And this is exactly how you get a level seven. This is how I got a level seven. Once I realized what my rate limiting step is, once I realized for me, it was these aha moments. Essentially what you can do from there on out is the following. You can ignore slash speed run almost everything else. You can cut the amount of time you spent studying by two thirds. I'll say that again. You can cut the amount of time you spent studying by two thirds when you realize that what you're really looking for is that rate limiting step and everything else is not, I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but what I am saying, it's not the most essential component towards achieving that perfect level seven. Why? Because you likely already know it. You likely already know what to do, right? If I showed you some arithmetic, you probably know how to add two numbers. So you don't need to spend all your time working on that. All right, this is what Jerry does, all right? He spends all his time on useless arithmetic. Don't. Don't do this, all right? And if we look at this from the perspective of the Pareto dis distribution, that would be like you spending all of your time, all your tasks on the left-hand side, okay? Doing what are known, what I like to call the easy side quests, right? Rather than spend all the time looking for, going through the mental, because it is more mentally challenging, mentally challenging component of actually trying to figure out what the rate limiting step is, actually trying to figure out the aha moment, actually just going through as many questions as possible. While that might be more challenging, it is the most valuable, the most time effective, and ultimately the path to which you can get that level seven. So the question then becomes, why do people not do this? Okay, first of all, they probably don't know. Second of all, the following, they fall into the trap of doing what's easy to do. All right, Jerry wants to do what's easy. Most students, when they study, whether they realize it or not, they're subconsciously priming themselves to do what's easy rather than the stuff that is hard and necessary. And I talk about this all the time on my YouTube channel, but if you can prime yourself and you can train your, your body, your mind, just yourself, if you can just train yourself to want to do what's difficult. Even if you don't feel like it, even if you don't want to, even if you want to procrastinate, if you train yourself to do what's challenging, it becomes so easy. And this is also why I, and I was brief, I, I just filmed a video talking about this, that one of the reasons why I find the IB valuable. All right, I'm not gonna say whether or not I like it, like I haven't really made a <laughs> conclusive opinion on that, but the IB is valuable. And the reason why it's valuable is because it trains you to get a lot of things done in a certain, in a very constrained time period. All right, it builds those skills that you need to achieve success academically in a rigorous environment, which means what? Which means that it purposely puts you through stuff that is difficult. And when you purposely put yourself through stuff that is difficult, work that is difficult, whatever that is challenging, that expands you towards that ideal version of yourself, which you talk about, okay? Nine times out of 10, the ideal version of yourself for most people is a competent, disciplined individual who succeeds and has basically anything he wants in life. All right. In order to achieve that, you need the skill set of doing what's difficult, even when you don't feel like it, doing a discipline and ultimately getting things done. So if we go back here, Jerry does not want to do that. He wants to spend all his time working on the easy parts, right? Doing these little side quests, 
doing the arithmetic, all this useless stuff that is not the highest value task. All right, it's not the stuff on the far right of the Pareto distribution. So let me give you another example to really nail this home. And I'm gonna do a few more quick examples to bring this all together in just a second. All right, so let's say I give you this question right here, or excuse me, I'm gonna give you these, this part of the data booklet. All right, so this is the formula for the sum and products of polynomial roots. All right. Now, let's say I give you this polynomial right here, 2x squared plus 6x plus 3. I want you to, with the polynomial equation above, solve this question. All right, so pause the video right now if you want. Take some time, solve it, and then meet me back here. And I want you to solve it by thinking of what is the limiting step. If you have trouble doing this question, meaning it doesn't just, you don't, you don't figure it out right away. If it takes you some time, ask yourself, why does it figure, why does it take me some time? What is stopping me from achieving this? And then I want you to identify that aspect and drill that down. Cause that's where you get really just disproportionate results. You get significantly more outcome for the little amount of time that you put in. All right. And this is also how I'm able to study so little time. It's because I spent all my time doing the actual difficult, necessary tasks. All right. I mean, during the IB, I spent maybe like three hours every single day just studying. And that was, that was like three hours on the bus, right? So I spent like an hour and a bit on the bus there, an hour and a bit back, a little bit at school, a little bit home. By the time like six o'clock rolled out, six, six o'clock, six 30, I was done with school. I had literally nothing to do for the rest of the day. I could, or I didn't have any schoolwork to do for the rest of the day. I could spend that time working on my businesses, spend that time working on my extracurriculars, spend that time with friends, family, hobbies, playing video games, whatever I wanted to do. All right. So Solve this question and I'll see you back in just a second. All right, so hopefully you realize after doing this question right here, excuse me, right here. Hopefully you realize after doing this question right here that you can utilize the same aha moment trick that we utilized before of alpha squared plus beta squared, just like the following, right? Remember that alpha squared, this was explained in the previous question. If you haven't seen the previous question that I just covered a minute ago, please go back and review that. But if we look at this right here, we know based on what we talked about before that this is simply alpha plus beta squared minus two alpha beta. Excellent. So now we've identified the following. All right, this is future Joaquin. I forgot to mention that alpha and beta are the roots of the equation. All right, so alpha is the first root, beta is the second root. Keep that in mind when you're solving this question. So if we look at what we have written down right here, we realize that alpha squared plus beta squared can be written as the following, alpha plus beta squared minus two alpha beta. All right, this already is the aha moment. For most people, this is the rate limiting step. They don't realize this expression right here. They don't realize how to get to this. And maybe they haven't built the skills they need to figure this out. If that's the case, you need to work on your intuition. You need to work on really reviewing these types of formulas, doing as many questions as possible that involve this type of manipulation. This is also why competition questions are pretty valuable because they build this part of your intuition. Good. Now, another reason why you might not have succeeded is because you don't understand the formula. That could as well be a rate limiting step. So if we look at the formula right here, and I'm gonna go back one so you can see it. Essentially what this formula is trying to say, and I'll write it here on the left-hand side, is that the sum of roots in this case, there are two. So alpha plus beta is equal to negative n minus one over, or excuse me, a to the power of n minus one and then, or a subscript n, plus, n minus one, excuse me, and then a subscript n. So since this is a polynomial, you need to understand that n is equal to two in this case. Why? Because we simply have a degree two polynomial, as you can see right there. So again, this is, for most people, this is, believe it or not, this is a rate limiting step. They don't understand how to apply the formula, all right? This is actually one of the easiest rate limiting steps to do because once you understand the formula, it becomes so easy. So going back here, now that we know that n is equal to two, we can simply just substitute this in. So two minus one over eight, two is equal to negative one over eight, two. Now these are the coefficients in front of the first x and in front of the second x, so x squared, so this would be, and then this would be, so a1 and then a2, like this. All right, that's just, again, notation. You need to understand the notation. That might also be a rate limiting set for most people, or for some people. Let's plug that in. If we have the expression here on the right-hand side, as you can see, we have 2x squared plus 6x plus 3 is equal to zero. If we plug that in, 
we realize that we have a1 is equal to 6, and then a2 is equal to 2 like this. All right, and that simply just comes from understanding the coefficients in front of that equation. Cool. We plug that in, we get negative 3. Now, we utilize the next equation here on the left-hand side, which is negative 1 to the power of 2 because n is equal to 2 because we have 2 polynomial, or excuse me, the, the degree of the polynomial is 2 because we have x squared. That's the largest degree. So the degree of the polynomial is 2. That's the large exponential, which means that's the degree. So the degree is 2. That's why n is equal to 2. And then we simply substitute this in, just like the following. And we get that this right here is 1 multiplied by a0, which if we look at the equation again here on the right-hand side, that's simply the constant, so that's 3. And then a2 is simply 2 like this, so we get 3 over 2. Now, I'm going to stop right here and make a very interesting point. All right, in fact, I'm going to stop doing this question altogether. We now figured out what the expression is right here on the here on the top. This is typically the rate limiting step for most people. When we figured that out. We also figured out these two values right here. So the last thing that is left to do is to complete the question with arithmetic, meaning we plug these numbers in and we just chug. Now, I'm not going to do that. And the reason why I'm not going to do that is because it's a, not a good use of my time. All right. Me doing arithmetic, me simply plugging in numbers and just doing it all together. It's fun. It's easy. It's easy to do, but it's not the most valuable task. It is not the most valuable output. That is very important for you to understand. And this is basically my entire point. You do not need to spend time doing the tasks you already know how to do if you're trying to optimize learning your most limiting steps. I'm not saying don't do it. Like, I mean, every once in a while, make sure you understand how to do the arithmetic and most certainly make sure you don't make any silly mistakes on the exam, but don't spend your time mindlessly plugging things in simply because it's easy to do. Okay, this is a not a good use of your time. And I see a lot of students, I cannot tell you how many times this happens. I spend time working with them on mathematics over the past, I've been doing this for like six years now. For the past six years, I spend time working with them on mathematics and they spend like two thirds of their time are allocated towards plugging numbers in and then making a mistake with their calculator. And then, and then it, they I also love it when students just purposely make it slow. Like I used to do this all the time. Basically when I plug things into the calculator, I like slowly put the numbers in taking my time, like expanding the time as long as possible. Don't do that. It is a low value task. You need to train yourself to do what's difficult because only then can you actually make progress. And the thing is only then will you actually have a free time to do what's fun, whatever. This is not fun. All right, just, just putting numbers in, this is probably not fun for you. Okay, it depends on who, but you're probably not fun. What I prefer to do is to spend time with my family. I prefer to spend time with my friends. You would probably agree. You would probably would rather hang out with your friends or rather play video games if you like that or rather watch a movie than plug in numbers like this. So I'm gonna tell you exactly how to do more of that. And you do more of that by not doing the easy stuff. You stop doing this quote unquote fun stuff so you can have actual time later on in the day or later on in the week to actually do things that you find fun. So the point I'm trying to make is don't waste your time on useless arithmetic because it is not going to help you as much as simply identifying what the rate limiting step is, wherever that may be in the progress. All right, so understand the following, that Jerry spends all his time on the easy fillers, which is what I was literally just saying, so don't do that. The mindset shift I wanna give to you, and again, when I heard this advice, changed my life. If you do what's easy, your life will be hard. If you do what's hard, your life will be easy. This is why I emphasize in all my videos to do things that are challenging. This is why I love going to the gym. This is why I love just doing difficult things because it makes me a better person. It gets me closer to that ideal version of myself. And even if I don't get anything out of it, meaning I can go through the IB and I can literally forget everything. Like the, the minute the exam ends, if my memory was wiped, meaning I forget everything I learned throughout the IB journey, I still would, assuming I didn't wipe my personality or anything, I like any skills I gained, I would still have those skills of hard work, commitment, discipline, ambition, and the rest of it. All right, in fact, most students probably realize this, right? The minute they're done with the exam, they walk out of the IB and they're like, yeah, they just forget everything. All right, I've been there too. So understand that if you do what's easy, your life will be hard. If you do what's hard, your life will be easy. All right, and the reason why this is so challenging and this is one of the biggest, like, stumbling blocks that really stop students from truly achieving their potential is because they're essentially at the end of the tether of their monkey brain, right? Of their evolution brain, right? Their evolution brain, like we're evolutionarily designed to do what's fun. We're evolutionarily designed from like just a strictly evolutionary perspective to do what costs the least amount of energy. Why? Because we need to survive. 
And if you had to choose between doing what's easy and doing what's hard, and they would both give you the exact same output, in an evolutionary perspective, you want to do what's easy because that conserves energy, right? If you do what's hard, that could cost too much energy. You might not get as much out of it, or you might do it, but you end up burning all your energy. That could be fatal. You could die. So understand that your brain is designed to do what's fun and easy. So you can either do one of two things. You can either try to argue against this and say no, and then try to like willpower your way through it, like muscle through it. Bad idea. Or you can utilize this fact and try to make this somehow fun and easy, right? You can try to make this fun and easy. This is oftentimes why I... This is oftentimes why I like doing as many questions as possible with the IV exam, because I get to put on some EDM music. All right. This is the only time in the entire, like the only time I listen to electronic dance music, specifically progressive trance from 2013. I, I love that. I love that genre of music, by the way. The only time I listen to that type of music is this time when I'm sitting down and doing as many math questions as humanly possible. So I started to associate doing the actual difficult work with fun stuff. So to associate thinking with listening to a lot of music and it, it essentially it builds that association between doing work and listening to music and that makes it fun. So I urge you to find ways to leverage this into your own life, find ways to add into your own life, the stuff that is fun and the stuff that is easy, but also understand that you will be tempted to do what's fun and easy. Do not fall to that temptation when it comes to tasks that are low value. You need to spend all your time doing the high value tasks. So this is the mindset shift. I offer to you. Bjorn takes the least steps possible to find the aha. Uh -huh. All right, changed my life again. When I started doing this with mathematics, I'm trying to think of the so the trigonometry test. I identified exactly like what what was the problem. I forget exactly what it was. I just, it, it's not it's leaving my head right at this moment. I forgot exactly what it was, but that was my main objective with that trig test that I got the first seven in. Okay, I, got, I went from a four to a seven from the logic test to my trig test. What I did is I asked myself, how can I take the least steps possible to find the aha moment? And all my studying, I still spent the same, I spent the, look, this is crazy. I spent the same amount of time studying, but my studying was focused towards doing as many questions as possible, targeted towards only looking for that aha moment, only looking for that rate limiting step. So if you found this video helpful so far, please share it to one of your friends who you think will find value. Maybe you have an ambitious friend. Maybe you have a friend that isn't doing so well, or maybe you just want to, give this video to one of your friends that you know will help, please do me a big favor and just share this video and also do that because more than anything, I know this content is going to be valuable. I know this content is going to help them because it really changed my life, all right, from a level four to a level seven. So please take a second, share it. I'd be very, very grateful. All right, let's go over a few examples illustrating this exact point. Okay, first of all, I'm going to go through a very easy example, series and sequences. All right, this question right here. And by the way, you want to stick until the last example here because the last example is going to be on induction, which I'm going to show you a trick on induction that allowed me to, I became in, invincible when it came to induction after learning this. Okay. So you want to stick until the end. Now here's a question on sequences and series. All right. So the sum of an infinite geometric sequence is 27, negative nine, three, negative one. So let me ask you this. If you are unable to do this question, Okay, most people here can probably do this. I, I don't doubt that you can. But if you're unable to do this question, ask yourself, why? What is stopping you? My guess when it comes to this right here is that you probably don't know the formula. You probably don't know the content. There's probably some conceptual thing that you're not super clean on. So you want to spend all your time focusing on that. You want to allocate all your resources towards identifying and learning and then practicing the content. Okay, that's it. Like, don't don't worry about. You, you shouldn't even start this. Like, don't do this question until you understand how to do it. All right, because most people. I mean, you can spend some time thinking about it. I'm not saying don't think about it or jot some notes down. But a lot of people will do. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Identify exactly what it is that's going on here. Identify where you think you can't do it, and then start doing it. Once you identify what that is, and once you tackle that all. In this question, I would be almost certain, almost 100% certain that if you can't do this, it's probably because you don't understand the content. All right. So for that reason, I'm not going to do this because it's pretty straightforward. Look at the equation, plug stuff in. I think it's a better use of your time to move on to the next example, which is calculus. All right. So this example is more difficult <laughs> to say the least. And again, this video is mainly for math HL students and specifically math HL students who want to go from a level five and six to a level seven. Okay. That's basically what I'm targeting in this video. If you are of that demographic, Welcome. If you are of the math SL, this is typically as far as you'll go. Typically. All right. There is some like math HL concepts as in by concepts, excuse me, by concepts, I don't mean content. 
because math HL and math SL content, obviously they're in different exams, but the idea of creatively trying to solve a problem can show up in the SL part. All right, but it's typically like the last question. So let's look at the math HL content right here. This is calculus. Let's do the following question. All right, so I want you to spend some time, write this question out and ask yourself, why can I not do it? Or if you are able to do it, congrats. But if you're not able to do it, ask yourself, why am I able to do it? And if you are able to do it, I want you to ask yourself the question as well. What was the aha moment? What was the click I knew or I needed to know that allowed me to solve this question, that allowed me to find the solution? And if you're struggling, ask yourself what you're missing. What is stopping you from achieving that goal? And I would almost guarantee that if you're unable to do this, it's probably because you don't know the trick. Okay, you haven't seen the aha moment. And this is where building your intuition really comes into play. All right, so take a second, solve this question. I'll see you back in just a second. All right, so welcome back, everybody. Let's begin tackling this question. So I'm going to start here on my whiteboard here on the left. I'm going to write it down. So we have the integral of tan 3x dx. And by the way, these indefinite integrals, they're a pretty good use of your time. And the reason why they're a very good use of the time is because it trains you to find what that aha moment is. When it comes to integrals, there's typically, from my experience, a sort of trick that there's like some sort of thing you got to know on how to manipulate it that once you've seen it, it helps you from here on out. All right. So the trick in this question and the reason why most people aren't able to move from this point is they haven't seen the following. All right. I'm going to do the following right here. I'm going to write this out as tan x times tan squared x dx. Now, hopefully you see the trick if you haven't done so already, but hopefully you see the trick here. And this for most people is the rate limiting step, understanding this move right here. Okay, let me show you. You know that, or it's known that one of the identities with tan squared x is the following, secant squared x minus one. All right, this is in the formula booklet. This is something that you should just have memorized. Just understand this concept, understand secant squared x minus one. Just know that point blank period. Understand that this is what it is. So let's plug that in. So we get tangent of x times secant squared x minus one. All right, so I'm gonna label this right here as the aha moment number one. Meaning that most people are unable to proceed because they don't know how to apply this concept, they don't know how to apply this concept right here into the answer. So they might know, like, I, I knew this, okay? If you were to ask me, like, maybe two years, like a year ago, or two years ago, excuse me, when I was in the IB, if you were to ask me, how do I solve this question? Actually, more like two and a half years now, it's three years, it's been a while. But if you were to ask me how to ask this, how to answer this question without showing me the trick, I probably would have been able to tell you like if you just if you just ask me like what's the how can I rewrite tan squared x I probably would have been able to tell you that you can use this identity, but I might not have been able to bridge the gap between using that identity and then applying it into this very question. So again, that might be the limiting step: identifying what that aha moment is. How do you overcome that? Practice. Okay, just do as many of these as you possibly can with the intention of only doing the aha moment. That's the key. And also, that's how you do as many questions as possible, right? If you want to get just sheer volume. You do sheer volume by spending as little time as you can on each question. All right. And I'm not saying spend as little time as possible. Like just don't like, like most people like get a bad connotation when they, when they hear that, like spend as little time as possible, but your goal should be to, to ignore. I think a better way to put it is you should ignore all the steps that don't contribute towards you figuring out that aha. So let's go back here. We know that this is the case. Secant squared X minus one. We plug that in right here. We're left with the following. Now let's rearrange this. So we get tangent of X times secant squared x minus, and I'm going to split this into a second integral, tan of x dx. All right. So we, I would imagine that if you've done calculus already, you probably know how to do this guy right here. So I'm not going to explain this, but what you end up getting is the following. You get secant x like this, ln of secant squared, or excuse me, ln of secant of x. That's just how it is. If you want to know how, this is another aha moment. Okay, this might be a rate limiting step for some people, but this is simply sine of x over cosine of x. All right, and you can actually do a substitution. You realize that one, one of these is the derivative of the other because the derivative of sine is cosine. So you can do a u substitution and then you implement that 
and then you realize that you get this expression right here. All right, so you get one over u as the substitution. I'm not gonna do it right now. Just something to consider, okay? Now, the other rate limiting step, so this is one right here, and also this is why this is so valuable. This is why doing these questions, these integral questions are so valuable because there's just so many of these rate limiting steps. There's so many of these aha moments. Like there's an aha moment here, either you know this or you don't. There's another one here, either you know this or you don't. And if you haven't seen it, you gotta build that intuition or you gotta figure it out or you gotta build the skills to figure it out. That's what's key. So let's go back to trying to figure this out right here. Now, how exactly do you do this? Well, rate limiting step again. Turns out that, and hopefully you can see this, the, and again, you gotta know what the derivative of tangent of X is. Turns out the derivative of tangent of X is this expression right here. So, and by the way, I'm, I'm missing the DX, excuse me. Don't miss the DX, you'll probably use, pro, I'm, I'm saying probably, because you probably will use, lose marks, excuse me, if you don't add that in. So let's do a substitution here. Turns out that u can equal tangent of x. So du dx is equal to secant squared of x. And then we can just plug that in. So du is secant squared x times dx, just like this. Okay, so let's substitute that in. So we literally just get integral of this. That's what this integral right here is. Let's do a different color. Let's do green. This integral right here can be thought of as this guy right here. Excellent, so we get u du like this. Taking the integral of this should hopefully be pretty straightforward. So this should be pretty straightforward. Basically it's just u squared over one half and then you replace u one half like this times tangent of x squared. And then we combine this guy and this, and I'm not even gonna combine it because it doesn't matter. All right, the point is not to spend an extra like 15 seconds just trying to add this up and then write the question nicely. That is not the point. The point is simply, in fact, like this right here was somewhat redundant. I shouldn't have spent like this step right here I think was somewhat redundant. I should have just gone directly into trying to realize what the aha moment is, learning that and then moving on to the next question. Okay, the point here isn't to be perfect. Far from it. The point here is to identify exactly what is stopping me and then really nail that in. That's what's key. Cool. So I'm not even going to finish this off because you don't need to. All right. And I say you don't need to because I assume that is not the reason why you failed. I assume the reason why you're failing or excuse me. And I'm saying that because I assume that's not the reason why you might not be able to solve this question if you have trouble. The reason why you may not be able to solve this question, I don't think has to do with you being unable to add up two different cosine functions. So don't spend time doing that. Awesome. So this was the question of trying to find the integral of tangent cubed. All right, let's move on to a very fun induction question. And this is right here. This is how I was able to completely master induction. All right. So let's go back to the question that I mentioned earlier with the geometric sequences, with the geometric sequence, excuse me. All right, so we want to find, as you can see right here, we want to find the induction. We wanna prove this expression here on the left-hand side. Now, this is what most people would do. Most people, okay, they're trying to do this. They see like, oh, it's seven marks, all right? They're gonna do the easy parts first and they're gonna spend all their time working on the easy part and then they're gonna get stuck on the hard part and they're not gonna make any progress and then they're gonna, they're gonna waste like 20 minutes. Okay, this is what most people do and this is what I was doing. Okay, this is how I approached induction before I learned this trick. Essentially, you don't spend time finding the base case. Okay, do, do not. That is the easiest points. I, I, I have yet to see a person who fails on the base case. All right, <laughs> hopefully you don't fail on the base case. Don't spend time on the base case. You're literally just plugging and chugging like, don't spend your time there when you do these practice questions. Obviously on the exam, yeah, but when you're doing practice questions and you wanna really master the rate limiting step, master this, again, we talk about the, the aha moments, do not do the base case. I wanna, I, this annoys me a lot because what the students I work with, they, they try to do the, don't, don't, do not. Instead, do the following, all right? And I'm gonna do this question and then I'm gonna talk about it after I've done it, all right? So as you can see here on the left-hand side, I have the tablet and then let me just double check. All right, so essentially the way to do this is the following. I'm gonna just write the induction hypothesis 
In fact, this this step right here isn't completely necessary. All right, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend time defining k because it's a waste of time. Then what I'm gonna do is I want to find k plus one, so I'm gonna do sum k plus one is equal to sum of k plus the k plus one term, which is this k plus one minus one like this. Right. No, notice how I'm not filling in any of the details. I'm not filling in the actual sum here because I know that this sum is this expression right here. So I'm going to fill that in, substitute it, excuse me, 1 minus r plus this. Now, this is where you, you save time. Instead of writing this expression and then rewriting it again on a second line, I'm just going to, since I know I'm going to need to add this up somehow, and I can just tell by looking at this expression right here, I'm going to already multiply by the denominator. So I'm going to make the fraction like this, and then I'm going to subtract here. So basically what I did is I did three steps in one right there. I multiplied this entire thing by one minus R like this so that I can get this on the same denominator. Now I can add it up. I also subtracted these two right here. All right. So this is basically once you start doing enough of these questions, you get into the state of ignoring like what you want to do is you Again, don't do this in the actual exam because you want to show your work. But when you're practicing, stop spending time writing stuff that you can do in your head. All right. In fact, you want to train yourself to do a lot of this stuff in your head because that builds the intuition. All right. I know your teacher probably doesn't say that. Like they say, oh, you should write everything out. Yeah, because they <laughs> they want to have an organized exam to write. And you should be right. Like they're completely correct. You should be writing things out during the actual exam. But when you're practicing, remove all the unessentials. Okay. Even like this is such a fundamental idea not only when doing math but also just for success in general in life right one of the biggest reasons why i was able to achieve success in the ib was because i was able to say no to like 90 percent of the stuff i was doing in high school okay there was tons of clubs i was in tons of different initiatives tons of different extracurriculars tons of different stuff i wanted to do and i said no to like 90 percent of that and because of that that gave me the ability to say yes to the select few of tasks that gave me the most output so by not writing this stuff down what you're really doing is you're saying no to all the tasks, the low value tasks that you already know how to do. Like you already know what one minus one is. So don't do it. Now we'll finish writing this off. I'm going to expand this all in one step. Minus RK plus ARK like this minus A times R times RK. All right, I'm not even gonna write the denominator because <laughs> you don't need to. It's a repeat step. Okay, and this should be A right here. So just make sure you copied that correctly. Now, notice how these two cancel, so you can cut those out. And then I'm left with A and A minus like this. All right, so I can factor it out and I'm left with A minus R times K. So this right here turns into R K plus one. Okay, basic exponentials, make sure you understand that. A plus one. All right, that's it, that's it. That's your induction proof. No, like you don't need to spend any more time doing this. Don't write a paragraph. Don't like I saw. I remember seeing the meme of the of the seagull like like vomiting out the induction paragraph at the end. Don't do that. You don't need to write the induction paragraph. You don't need to do anything. The only thing that matters is you understand the aha moment, which is literally this right here. In fact, I could have simplified this even more. I'm literally I'm trying to show you how to do this as simple as you possibly can. But this right here is the aha. Right. This is typically the rate limiting step in almost all induction questions for most people. They don't understand how to con how to use the induction hypothesis with the next step. This is tip like with the K plus one term. This is typically the mistake that most students make. All right. They don't understand how to connect these two together. So by you going directly to that, whoops, by you going directly to that and combining that together, this is where you're going to get a significant advantage. Also notice how fast I did this. All right. I missed out on a lot of important details which is again, exactly the point. You wanna do these as fast as possible so that you can really nail down the skill of finding this aha moment, okay? 90% of your time needs to be spent on the most difficult part of the question, on the rate limiting step, whatever that may be for you. I'm just assuming that for most people it's probably figuring this out. So I could have actually not even done this because this was like just algebra, right? This was just adding terms. You see how, you see how I multiplied it out right here and then I tried to add it up there and then I subtracted it out. <laughs> I don't need to do that. I know how to subtract these two terms. I know how to do this. I could have literally ended the induction proof right there. Maybe I think for induction, you might need to go one or two steps further. All right. And in all questions, this might, it might not be as simple as this. Like maybe you, you need to, to add this up because there might be another, there might be another rate limiting step 
towards simplifying this further. But essentially the point here is you don't want to spend that much time outside of the aha moment. All right. And this applies specifically to induction. If you just do these questions as fast as possible with the intention of learning the rate limiting step and identifying that and then mastering that part, just do these as a machine. Like you want to just turn into a bot doing these as many as possible. This is why I love listening to EDM music specifically for this case. It becomes so incredibly easy to win, right? It just becomes so easy to win. All right. And that is it for this math training session. I hope you enjoyed this one. I will be releasing parts of the full three hour in-depth training in the next few weeks. So if you haven't stayed subscribed, please subscribe already. If you thought, if you thought this was valuable, wait until you head over and watch that three hour training. You're going to get so much value out of that. It's going to completely change the way you do mathematics. This was just a taste of that, that the students were saying was pretty valuable. So this was one of the gold nuggets of that three hour training, three hour mastermind. Hope you found this valuable. If you know a friend who's doing math HL, or you know a friend who's doing math, they may be doing very well, or you want to take them to the next level, or they may be struggling, simply just share this video, all right? That would help me out a lot. I spent a lot of time really nailing down these strategies. I'm almost at an hour here filming this video of my own time at the university. So this is time that I spend towards helping you guys, namely my brother and sister, as well as all the Grizzly students who are going through the mathematics IB diploma and then want to get into their top university. All right, so please share this with any of your friends who you think will benefit. And until next time, Stay grizzly. All right, I'll see you in the next video.